Hi, today I'll be reviewing AP Chemistry Unit 3, Intermolecular Forces and Gas Laws. So let's get started. So Unit 3.1, Intermolecular Forces. So we'll first start off with water boiling. So water molecules are attracted to each other through intermolecular forces. And when water starts boiling, these forces break, which makes water evaporate. The atoms of water remain together and do not separate. And this is the reaction shown with water liquid changing to water gas with the addition of heat, which is not shown. So intramolecular forces versus intramolecular forces. An intramolecular force is an interaction between a single molecule. And one example of that is a covalent bond. Intramolecular forces are interactions between multiple molecules. And they're also known as columbic forces, but these are much weaker than covalent bonds. So now let's go over the types of intramolecular forces. So the first one we have is dipole-dipole interaction. So dipole-dipole interactions occur between two polar molecules. And the polar molecules could be attractive or repulsive. And the molecules orient themselves to maximize attraction to the greatest extent possible. The strength of these interactions depend on the magnitude of the dipole. The greater the dipole, the greater the attraction. Lower the dipole, lower attraction. Examples of molecules with dipole-dipole interactions are CO, NaCl, and any other polar mo molecules. Dipole and induced dipole movements are basically between a polar and a nonpolar molecule. London dispersion forces are basically uh, in all the, pretty much all uh, nonpolar molecules and all molecules exhibit London dispersion forces. But then it's the primary type of interaction between nonpolar molecules. And the strength of London dispersion forces depends on how polarizable the electron is. And we also have hydrogen bonding, which is the best one, in my opinion. So hydrogen bonding is a special case of a dipole-dipole bond with a highly electronegative oxygen drawing electrons away from hydrogens. And it's unusually strong, and it only takes place between a hydrogen that's covalently, covalently bonded to a highly electronegative atom with another uh, electronegative element. So these electronegative elements, fluorine, oxygen, and nitrogen, these are the only three that hydrogen will bond to. And what this does is that it creates an extremely strong bond, which is still weak compared to covalent bonds, but it allows the water, uh, like molecules such as water to not, uh, to require a lot more energy than other, other uh, molecules in order to break them apart. And that's shown with this table over, sorry, that's shown with this table over here, uh, showcasing the boiling points of water with other H2 molecules. And one way that you could use to memorize hydrogen bonding is just to know that hydrogen bonding is bond. And that's what my teacher gave me. And it's honestly quite helpful. So like hydrogen bonding is bond with bond being fluorine, oxygen, and nitrogen. And we also have ion dipole interactions, which are basically stronger than hydrogen bonding. And they're used to separate the cation and anion. And that's shown over here. So what can be explained by intramolecular forces? Like what can you use intramolecular forces to justify? You can use melting and boiling points. You can use vapor pressure. You can use surface tension, viscosity, heat of vaporization, and volatility. And some properties that increase as IMFs increase are melting and boiling point, surface tension, viscosity, or the resistance to flow. Uh, one, of, one example of that is honey and heat of vaporization. Properties that decrease as IMFs increase are vapor pressure. And if you want to compare the magnitude of intramolecular forces, then hydrogen bonding is the greatest, with dipole-dipole being the middle. That's only used for polar molecules and LDF being the worst. But LDF depends on, on polarizability. So this is only working if the size and the size between all the molecules are comparable. So it's not always true. 
So now let's go into 3.2 types of solids. So there's four main types of solids, and there's more in the next couple of slides. So the first type of solid is an ionic solid. So an ionic solid is basically formed by a cation, which is usually a metal, and an anion, which is a non-metal. And the formula represents the ratios of cations and anions. So all of these ionic solids have high melting and boiling points, and they're brittle. They're also poor conductors of electricity as a solid, but they're extremely good conductors in liquid and aqueous solutions, air soluble. And ions must be free to flow for electricity to conduct. So this diagram up here just shows like how an ionic solid, why it's pretty much, why it breaks at times. So, so I'll just try anti. And so basically what you have over here is you have um, a positive cation and non-metal anion over here. And if you use like an imp if you impact it with let's say a hammer, so once it goes down, the, the non-metals are together and the cations are together. And what happens when both of these are together is that it starts to break apart due to due to it not repulsing anymore and it breaks up. Next, we're going to see molecular solids such as CO2. So these molecular solids are formed by nonmetals exclusively. And they're weak IMFs. They, I mean, they have weak uh, IMFs. So they have a low melting and boiling point, And they're poor conductors of electricity. The third type are metallic solids, such as Cu or copper. They're formed by metallic elements, and they exhibit metallic bond bonding. So with metallic bonding, you have the valence electrons that are free to flow from atom to atom, which allows electricity to conduct extremely well. And these are extremely malleable and ductile. Some examples of metallic solids are uh, Cu, copper, silver, iron, you know, steel, and things like that. So some more types of solids are covalent network solids, such as diamonds. And these are formed by distinct atoms in a clear network. And all of these are sp3 hybridized, which you should remember because I've seen problems like that on some tests. These are extremely strong and have a high melting point. And they're formed by carbon and semi-metals, such as silicon, germanium, boron. But these are poor conductors of electricity. For example, some, ex some examples of these are so SIC, BC, and SiO2. And this is a picture of a covalent network solid, such as like a diamond, shown over here with these being carbon molecules. And you also have graphite, which is more common allotrope of carbon. And all of these are sp2 hybridized. And it's basically, so graphite's used in a lot of things. And one of its more common uses is, is as a pencil. And so basically you have like thin sheets of carbon that's shown over here that break apart due to the weak attraction between the sheets. And they're all ex excellent conductors of electricity. So we just have a problem over here, which asks us which of the following could be the identity of a white crystalline solid that exhibits the following properties. It melts at 360 degrees Celsius, which is not too high. It does not conduct electricity as solid, and it conducts electricity as in an aqueous solution. So let's just first start off by taking out what is wrong. So the first thing you have to know is that it conducts electricity in an aqueous solution. And the only ones that can, uh, that like are extremely good at conducting electricity in aqueous solution are is KOH. So along with that, you have, this is a molecular solid and C12H22O11 is not a good conductor of electricity. So you can cut that out. SIC is also a poor conductor of, of electricity. AG is an extremely good conductor of electricity, but it can conduct electricity as a solid as well. So that's taken out. And also, so it's KOH, which is the answer.
yeah, we also have one more problem. So which of the following diagrams best illustrates how a metallic solid is malleable after displacement? So a metallic solid is just formed with cations and there's no anions. You can basically cut out A from the problem. Along with that, this, it doesn't, part B, this, well, answer B doesn't show much and it doesn't show anything regarding a displacement, which is wrong. So part C, what it does is it shows before displacement the cations being like regular and after being hit by something and being being uh, being uh, like being hit, you basically have the the cations move down a bit, which seems pretty good. And D, it's well wrong. It's yeah, it's not correct. So the answer is C. Now let's go into 3.3, .3, solids, liquids, and gases. So below zero degrees Celsius, water molecules are pretty much locked in place like ice. They move around a bit, but they don't move with each other and they retain shape and volume unless in a phase change. Liquid water. So liquid water basically has like the, the water can move around more than solid water, but, and are able to slide past one another and they can flow into any shape, but they have the same volume. Gaseous water. So attraction between mo water molecules are insignificant after 100 degrees Celsius. And oh, I forgot to, my bad. As you just assume the volume of the container is in, it's in, ah, my, oh, never mind, I'm good. So you just assume the volume of the container it is in. So 3.4, the ideal gas law. So volume is basically the space occupied by gas. So whatever volume there is, the gas will conform to that volume. So temperature is basically the measurement and an indicator of the average kinetic energy of gas molecules. The moles is basically the amount of gas molecules and pressure is basically the force exerted on a surface by molecular collisions. So the effect of volume on pressure. So pressure basically has a negative correlation on volume and it's inversely proportional to volume, which means the greater the pressure, the lower the volume, the lower the pressure, the greater the volume. Effect of amount of particles on pressure or the amount of moles on pressure is basically, as the amount of particles increases, the amount of collisions increases due to just there being so much more particles. And so pressure is directly proportional to the amount of particles in the container. Let's say. Effect of temperature on pressure. So as the temperature increases the kinetic energy of the particles, the pressure also increases as the collisions are more energetic and pressure is directly proportional to temperature. So such as Kelvin. So vol effect of volume on temperature. So volume is also directly proportional to, to temperature. And if you combine all of this, you get the equation PV equals NRT with R as the gas constant. And this chart over here just shows all the formulas. I need to change my color, my bad. All the formulas that you would need if you are doing problems like this, but I would try to work to understand it, not memorize it, but you do whatever you want. So partial pressure. So partial pressure is basically the pressure exerted by each individual gas in a container. So let's say if you had one gas and it's at like six ATM and you had like another gas and the ATM turns to 12. So the total, ATM is 12, and if you have PA, you can use P total and PA to calculate PB. And you can use this equation in order to calculate all the all the um the partial pressures of all of them. Along with that, you have the mole fraction, which is X. So X is the mole fraction. So X is the amount of moles of each particle divided by the amount of moles that are total. 
And that also equals the pressure of each particle divided by the total pressure. And this goes back to the last one with uh, pressure being directly correlated to the amount of moles. So let's try a problem like this. So the figures below represent two sealed containers, each with the same volume of two liters. The pressure of the AR, the argon container is two ATM. The contents of both containers are transferred to a one liter container at the same temperature. Sorry. The total pressure in the new container will be closest to, and it's asking us to find it. So what we have over here is we have two liters of volume and we have two ATM of pressure for AR, and we have to find the amount of uh, Zn first. So there's six particles of argon and there's three particles of Zn. And so we can determine the fact that we have one ATM. So P is one for here. As basically it's half the amount. So the pressure decreases by that specific amount since, yeah. And so now what you're trying to do is you have to bring all of this into a one liter container. So what you're trying to do for that is that you have to divide this by two, right? And as pressure is inversely proportional to volume, if you divide the volume by two, you have to multiply by two. So you have four ATM. And if you divide the liters by two, and you have to multiply by two. So that's two. So four plus two is six ATM, which is D. So 3.5, kinetic molecular theory. So the thing is, particles, they aren't all, they, they never are at the same speed. They all are in continuous random motion with the lighter particles moving faster than heavier particles. And the temperature is directly proportional to the kinetic energy. So between collisions, particles have a constant velocity and direction. And after collisions, particles have a new velocity and directions. And as particles collide, they don't stick to whatever surface they're colliding with. And so they just move around like a ping pong table. So does molecular size matter? So the larger particle size should collide more often than the smaller particle, but particle size becomes negligible. Sorry, my bad, I can't speak. Negligible once the container size is large since the particles are already extremely small. So if it was even just a little bit larger, it wouldn't matter much on the grand scheme of things. So particle speed. So individual particle speed is always changing. And at room temperature, particles can go from 0 to 1,500 meters per second. And due to a large number of particles, speed distribution remains consistent despite individual fluctuations. And this can be modeled by the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution curve. So with this curve, you basically have the x-axis showing the particle speed over here, and the y-axis correlating that speed to how much particles there are at that speed. And this is labeled as like a fraction. So basically, you can use the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution curve to show how particles do not move at the same speed. They all are at different speeds, but then there's an amount that goes at x like amount of particles that goes at like this speed or amount of par particles that go at this speed, but then not all of them go the same. So it's all dependent on, you know. Yeah, so comparing temperatures. So cold gas has more particles going at a slower speed while hot gases have the particles going at a higher average speed. And there are outliers such as, such as here or here but then most of them follow the curve. And heavy gases are having particles go at a slower average speed and hot gases having particles go at a faster average speed. So this just shows how like the, the distribution curve for a cold or heavy gas. And this shows the distribution curve for a light or hot gas. Three point six deviation from the ideal gas law. So ideal gases and the kinetic molecular theory. So collisions between gases are elastic. 
and particle volume and size is negligible. You also have the ideal gas law, PV equals nRT. But then ideal gases aren't actually ideal. There's real gases, which have a plethora of more factors. So these gases do not behave as neatly as shown with the ideal gas law. And some factors that they have are the fact that they can condense, they have attractive forces, and they can vary in size and volume. And there's just so much factors that are, that are there. And you don't have to calculate any problems. There's an equation for that, which is kind of painful. <laughs> and so the thing is, is with significant attraction, pressure decreases as collisions decrease. And as volume becomes significant, pressure is greater than predicted. But, as, uh, but at low pressure, space between molecules is much greater than the volume of molecules and the gas behaves ideally. Three point seven solutions and mixtures. So, what's the solution? So, a solution is basically a physical combination of any state of matter in which macroscopic properties do not vary. Another name of a solution is a homogeneous mixture. Heterogeneous mixtures have varying properties, but that's not what we're going to be talking about today. So, what makes up a solution? So, a solution is made up with a solvent and a solute. And along with that, I'm just tying in something else, which is molarity, which is the moles of solute per liters of solution, which is used in order to uh, find the, as like a unit for solutions. 2.8, representations of solutions. So particulate, particulate re representations of solutions communicate the structure and properties of these solutions by showing relative concentrations of the components using drawings that show these interactions among the components. So one of these types of drawings that you may have to create are ones showing the solubility of an ionic solid with water. So this is shown over here with, uh, with water molecules breaking up a sodium chloride molecule. And so basically what you have is the cation, the negative Sorry, the negative anion being attracted to the positive hydrogen cations, while the sodium cation is being attracted to the negative oxygen anions. So they're all breaking up using the water molecules in that aqueous solution. 3.9, separation of solutions and chromatography. So components of a solution cannot be separated by filtration as a process of separation must consider the differences between intermolecular attractions, like the bonding between the particles and the liquid that occurs. And one way to solve this issue is chromatography. As the chromatography can be used to separate components due to attractive forces among the components of the mobile and stationary phases. And the more polar a component of the solution, the less interaction it will have with the polar stationary base, the farther it will travel. So the more polar it is, the farther it'll travel across the, the paper, the filter paper. And the less polar it is, the more interaction it'll have and the less it'll tra travel. So more polar, the, the more it'll travel, less polar, the less it'll travel. So let's try a problem with this. So basically what you have is in a paper chromatography experiment, a sample of pigment is separated into two components, X and Y, as shown in the figure below. The surface of the paper is moderately polar. What can be concluded about X and Y based on the experimental results? So what you have is you have basically, you have hexane, which is uh, non-polar. However, the filter paper is slightly polar. Like, well, moderately, not slightly. And so with chromatography, the main things you can determine is which molecule is more polar, which is less polar. So both A and B are taken out. And so with that, so the farther it travels in a polar, the more, the more polar it is, the farther it'll travel, but then the less polar it is, the, the less it'll travel. So basically, what you're trying to 
find is which one's more polar than the other. And I'm not too, honestly, I'm not too sure about how, how much of a role hexane plays in it because the paper is moderately polar, but then the dye is nonpolar. So I guess either it can be either C or D, but then when I checked it, it, it was D. And so I guess that could be because of the hexane playing a role in, in making the, the surface of the paper more polar. And basically, basically that means that if the hexane has a role, then the paper will also be more nonpolar. So the more nonpolar it is, the the more it'll travel. So X is more nonpolar than Y. So that takes out C, so it'll be D. Sorry that I couldn't uh, help too much with this one. I have to submit a bit more. So substances with similar intramolecular attractions tend to be more soluble in one another. And ionic compounds tend to dissolve in polar solvents as the cations interact with the negative poles while the anions interact with the positive poles. So molecular compounds dissolve in nonpolar substances. And this can be basically said as like dissolves like. So polar substances dissolve in polar substances and nonpolar substances dissolve in nonpolar substances. So one example of like dissolves like is water and sodium chloride. So we have some problems with this. So sodium chloride is least soluble in which of the following liquids? So what we have to do is we have to find the least polar of all of these. So the first things we can do is we can take out water since water is polar and sodium chloride is polar. So it will it'll dissolve extremely well. HF we can take out too because that's polar. And we have CH3. C, C2H4O2 and CH3OH, which aren't, which are basically also polar. So you can take those out, which means CCL4, which is nonpolar due to the structure, it's the least soluble. And I'll be making a video on unit two also in case, uh, in order to review it. So I'll go more in depth into polarity and all of that. And we have another problem just like this. So of the following organic compounds, which is the least soluble in water at 298 Kelvin? So the least soluble in water. So water is polar, so you have to find something nonpolar. So what you can do is you can take out, you can take out this because it's slightly polar. You can take out CH3OH since that's also polar. You can take out C6H12O6 as that's polar. And you can take out CH3COH or acetic acid as that's polar. And so that makes hexane the one that's least likely to be soluble in water. 3.11, spectroscopy and the electromagnetic spectrum. So spectroscopy is basically the study of matter's interactions with the electromagnetic, sorry, electromagnetic radiation. So there's three things you gotta know with that. So basically, microwave radiation is associated with, associated with transitions in molecular rotational levels. Infrared radiation is associated with transitions in molecular vibrational levels. And ultraviolet or visible radiation is associated with transitions in electronic energy levels. So all three of these, you have to know like how microwave radiation plays a part, how infrared radiation plays a part in how uh, visible radiation plays a part as they will probably ask some questions on that. So you also have 3.12, the photoelectric effect. So for that, you have C equals lambda nu, of which C is the speed of light, 3.0 times 10 to, 10 to the eighth meters per second. V, uh, lambda, with, wait, nu, sorry, nu, which is frequency, and lambda, which is the wavelength. You also have E equals H or Planck's constant, which is 6.626 times 10 to negative four joules per second times uh, nu, which is the frequency. And using these two equations, you can create E equals H times speed of light over lambda in order to calculate the energy using 
without using a frequency. 3.13, beer limit law. So basically, the beer limit law is used to use in spect spectrophotometry. And so you have A equals ABC. So A is the absorbance measurement. Little a is the molar absorbity, absorb absorptivity, or how intensely a sample absorbs the light of a specific wavelength. B is the path length, which basically can be ignored as it's just one. And C is the concentration, which is in molarity. So this is like a question for this. And so which of the following is the most likely explanation for the variance of the data point for the 0 0.600 molar CUS of four solution? So you see the various point over here. So we can take out the first, the first thing that we can take out is, so the cubet into which the 6.6 .6 molar solution was placed had some water droplets inside. That wouldn't play too much of a role. It wouldn't cause something like this, like such a high variance to occur. So you can take that out. B, the cuvette into which the 0.6 molar solution had slightly more solution than the other cuvettes, that wouldn't play a role because basically a spectrophotometer just absorbs the light. It doesn't have, the measurement doesn't play a role. The amount that you put doesn't play a role in the spectrophotometer itself. So you can add a bit more if you made a mistake. So it wouldn't cause any changes. C, the wavelength setting was accidentally moved away from that of maximum absorbance. But then the thing is that is more of like a common sense answer, which basically, if you accidentally move it away, then would these, uh, these ones also increase, right? So if they didn't increase, then it wouldn't do such a thing. And so you would have to fix it. So it's like, unless you forgot about it, which kind of, so it's kind of like a bad answer. And D, so the cuvette used for the 0.6 molar solution had not been wiped clean before being put into the spectrophotometer. And for, and for this one, basically, if you don't wipe the spec, sorry, if you don't wipe the cuvette clean, it won't allow the light to go through, which means that it may cause a change in results. So D could be a possible answer. So D is probably the best choice out of all of them. And you also have one last problem. So a 0 0.389 gram sample of the ore is completely dissolved in, in concentrated HNO3 aqueous. Sorry, like, I, yeah, just, just one sec. And the mixture is diluted with water to a final volume of 25 milliliters. Assume the all the cobalt in the ore sample is converted to CO2 plus aqueous. So what is the CO2 plus concentration in the solution if the absorbance of the solution is 0.45? So that you can just use the mark one eyeball in order to find it. And so 0.45 of, is over here and you could just look over here. So that's around 0.08. So for A, you can just put it as 0.08 or And now it's asking us to use this, um, use the, to basically calculate the number of moles of CO2 plus in the 25 milliliter solution. And so what it's asking us to do is basically use this molarity and use the volume in order to calculate moles. So molarity is, moles per liter, so mole per liter. So 0 0.08 molarity would equal, so I'll just put moles with a little m, and then, and then I'll get the liters, which is, so 25 milliliters is 0 0.025 liters. You multiply both sides by 0.25. And 
then you get the amount of moles. And I'll just get a calculator to, to solve that one second. So 0 0.08 times 0 0.025, which is 0 0.002 moles. or 2.0 times 10 to negative three. You can see this either. So now you have to calculate the mass percent of CO in the 0 0.389 gram sample of the ore. And so using the mass percent, you have to do 0 0.002 moles and you have to convert the 0 0.002 to grams. So 0 0.002 moles CO. times one mole is effectively, get it, it's 59 grams. So then you can get the amount of yeah, grams, which I'll get it right now, one sec. And I'm just calculating it right now. So, which is 0 0.18 grams. I'll just put 0 0.02. So now what you have to do is you have to divide this. So um, the amount of moles divided by the total amount. So it will be 0 0.118 divided by 0 0.389. And you have to multiply it by 100 to get the percent. And for that, you basically get one second, three, eight, nine. And you get the mass percent as 30.3%. 30, 30 and that's our answer for part C. So clear all drawings, and I guess that's it. So I hope this video just helped with reviewing for the AP test. And I would recommend like just uh, studying with this and whatever other resources, especially the AP daily videos, which are extremely good, as I had to paraphrase some stuff in the in the in the videos without in the video without going into too much detail, which I wish I could have done more, but then I had like a time constraint. So thank you very much and I hope you all stay safe.